Hi, everybody. Welcome to the BC Wiltshire Sports Show. We're back with another Paralympic profile. I'm your host, Nate, and today I'm joined by soon to be two time Paralympian, wheelchair rugby player, Byron Green. How are you doing this morning, Byron? Doing great. Thanks for having me on, Nate. Nice. So, to start things off, can you just tell our audience a little bit about who you are, um, how, you, how you've been involved in rugby? Um, and yeah, we'll just get started with that. Yeah, so um, I got involved in wheelchair rugby. I was first introduced to it uh, by Duncan Campbell while I was going through rehab at, at GF Strong. Uh, it is kind of a cool story in that Duncan was one of the four uh, originators of the sport, four guys that created it in Manitoba. So, and he was my rec therapist when I was going through rehab. So. Uh, he introduced me to a lot of recreational activities, but of course he threw in wheelchair rugby because um, he always had that slight motive of, of helping grow the sport. And, oh, absolutely. And looking for promising young talent. Um, but it was, I, you know, I, I saw wheelchair rugby uh, at GF Strong, uh, but I wasn't hooked right away. It was a couple of years later when I had, uh, moved back to Vancouver uh, and started attending university. Uh, Duncan reached back out and uh, let me know that there was a like an intro to wheelchair rugby night starting up, and I started going to that, and that's when I really started to to get addicted to wheelchair rugby. <laughs> nice. It's uh, it's really interesting, actually. I I've, I've spoke to Duncan recently. And we'll be releasing an interview with him soon for our 50th anniversary series. But just the large amount of Paralympic wheelchair rugby players that have come from BC who Duncan has directly got involved into the sport. I think that's a really cool story. Um, just the amount of Paralympians that, that the inventor of the sport managed to, to get started on their journey. Um, yeah, well, I mean, yeah, it shows like Duncan's commitment, right, to, to being a builder in the sport of wheelchair rugby. Uh, yeah. So I've, like, I've done a little bit of recruitment myself, um, you know, as I, I've been playing for quite a while now and I've gotten involved at the club level and, um, and everything. And uh, part of having a healthy club is recruiting new athletes. Um, and so I, I've got a taste of how difficult it can be to, to attract people to, to a new sport. So um Props to Duncan for, for yeah. doing it for so many years and doing it so well. Yeah, recruitment, uh, you know, definitely has its challenges for sure. Um, but we're very fortunate, you know, to have people like you who are still very involved in the community, um, despite being, you know, an athlete at the highest level, still doing whatever you can to get people started, you know, at, at that base level and at that grassroots. And I think that's something that's really cool about the rugby community is just the amount of giving back that's done by people at all levels and of all roles within the system. But now to, to center things back on you, you said you really got into the sport uh, when you moved to Vancouver. And I, I know you moved out here at a time where real, wheelchair rugby specifically and specifically high performance wheelchair rugby was really booming um, in this area. So what was it like for you to get to train with a number of those guys who were at the highest level? And was that part of what made you decide to really give it a go competitively and to strive for those goals? Yeah, oh, absolutely. So, um, it, I, yeah, so I, I started in wheelchair rugby uh, while I was in university. And, you know, I made the provincial team after a couple of years and bumped up to the provincial A team a couple of years after that. Um, but it was really when I was kind of finishing up university that I made the decision that I really wanted to, to Get to that high performance level and, and see if I could make the national team. And a big part of that was uh, there was a really awesome core of, of national team athletes here in Vancouver, Trevor and Travis, Ian and Say. And uh, yeah, I, I just really wanted to be a part of that. Like they trained all the time and had a blast. And I was just really attracted to that and, and wanted to be part of that group. So yeah. definitely a big part of, of the appeal to uh to get to that high performance level i saw all the trips that they were taking and all the tournaments that they got to play at and and all that and just looked like a ton of fun so i was, yeah, just wanted to, 
to see if I could get there. And now you've been on the national team for, for I believe it's eight, coming up on nine years now, uh, which is probably pretty surreal for me to, me to say. Uh, but you broke into the team in 2013. Um, so right after London, right after the team, and, you know, won a silver medal. Um, what was the experience like for you breaking in at the international level into such a, a strong veteran group? Yeah, it was, you know, it, it was quite surreal. Um, I mean, making the team was a huge milestone for myself. It, it took me quite a few years and quite a few trials to, to get into the squad. Uh, so just getting there was just, I was over the moon, excited. And then joining such a high level team, like you mentioned, like they had just finished second in London and, and I joined the team right after and we finished seconds at world championships in Denmark in 2014. And uh, yeah, it was, it was just amazing to slide into such an amazing program. And I started to get you know, uh, some pretty good minutes early on. Uh, yeah, it was just unreal. Like I couldn't, I had to kind of like pinch myself because I never thought, like part of me never thought it, it would happen. And then to, to slide into such an amazing program right from the get-go, uh, I, I guess I, part of me just kind of expected to ride the bench for a long time and kind of earn my way up even once like to be, getting some significant minutes in big games. So yeah. now one of the things I, I just want to go back to something you said there, as you mentioned, you know, that you tried out for the team several times and that it was a long road. And then at first you couldn't really believe it when you broke in. So what was that experience like, um, you know, being one of the guys who was on the edge, you know, for a few years, probably had some ups and downs, um, taking some rejections here and there, what kept you going and what motivated you to keep pushing to, to, to make that breakthrough? I think, uh, yeah, it's hard to pinpoint exactly uh, like a single reason, but if there is uh, like a major single reason, it's probably just stubbornness. Like <laughs> I, I could be quite stubborn and, and I could be quite competitive in, in kind of a quiet way. Um, and so I, I, I really have my mind set on making the team so that that and the stubbornness just kept me going and, and kept me kept me training hard and, and pushing for it um another big reason why i i finally got selected is my classification changed i went from a one to a 0.5 and that to be honest that was a huge reason why i, I finally managed to break through i wasn't competing against the Chubbers and the Picos anymore. Um, and then also uh, Jared Funk stepped back after after London. So there was, you know, there was an opening there. So I managed to, to slide right in. So the timing timing was right. Um, but yeah, it takes a, a certain amount of stubbornness, determination, maybe a little bit of stupidity to keep banging your head against the wall when you're going to try out after try out and, and, uh, and not having success, but, but it pays well, off. You know, it's, it's all about hard work, meeting opportunity. And I think that's just a really kind of good lesson to take forward for, for a lot of other rugby players who might be in a similar situation where they're, they're trying out for a few years. They're kind of on that developmental path and having a hard time breaking in is that, um, you know, it, you can still succeed, you know, after several years of, of pushing through and, it's not going to happen for everybody, but there is always that chance that, that with that hard work and with the right opportunity at the right time, um, that things can work out in your favor. And and I want to just go back to another thing you mentioned where you were kind of being a little self-deprecating there, but you were talking about uh, expecting to ride the bench and, and probably not play too much. And I know at your first Paralympics, you weren't able to get on the floor uh, much at all um, in the actual games itself, but in a lot of the the pre-campaign and a lot of the events leading up to that, um, you did play a role. And obviously as a team member, uh, you were a big part of the team. So can you just talk to me about what that experience is like, kind of learning to accept a role within a team um, and still working and, and contributing and focusing on your goals day by day? Yeah, so my mindset early on when I made the national team was was very like individual. Like I was... I was thinking of myself and want, like wanting to be
be the guy that was starting in my in my um, classification and and playing lots of minutes and and being like being that that person um, and Rio was tough uh, not getting to play at all really I, I got like four minutes in in one game against against Brazil um, after the game was pretty much already decided right so in the fourth quarter and that was like I was really struggling uh, during that tournament just kind of accepting that like I, it was I was still thinking about myself right um, but that experience really taught me and kind of forced me to realize that the team sport you, you have to think of the team first and there's going to be 12 athletes and not all of them can be the starter. Um, and the team's goals supersede individual goals. So to be a good teammate and to be, uh, yeah, to, to be a good part of the team, you need to realize that uh, you can't be selfish in a way like that. You have to kind of accept where you're at. Not that, you're going to be in that role forever. You, you should still have that drive to, to push and maybe surpass a starter player and become a starter yourself. But you can't, uh, you can't let that disappointment or, or jadedness overshadow that you're still a part of the team and you still play an important role. Um, and, you, and you need to, to accept that to a degree. Nice. And I know there, there's been some major events where you have played a, a really significant role and started and got a lot of minutes. And one of those that sticks out to me was actually the, the Toronto Pair Pan Am Games, which while a lot of Paralympics is a major multi-sport games and was a really big moment um, for Team Canada. You guys won gold on home soil in front of a, a really packed crowd in Mississauga. So what was that experience like at those games for you? Um, and yeah, can you just talk me through that? Yeah, it was surreal. So uh, heading into Para Pan Ams, it was my first multi-sport uh, event. So the first time that we would get to stay in a village, uh, like with all the other athletes and, you know, there would be the giant mess hall with all the different food options and an opening ceremonies, a closing ceremonies, all the pomp and circumstance that come with a multi-sport event that is very different than any sort of wheelchair rugby tournament. Even world championships is like, it's, does not even come close to comparing with a pair of Pan Ams or a Paralympics in terms of all the stuff that's going around outside of the actual wheelchair rugby tournament. Yeah. Um, so that, so obviously I was super excited going into that. Um, and last minute, like, so our kind of our staging camp before, uh, before we go into the village, uh, I found out that Miranda, uh, the other 0.5 on Team Canada at the time was injured and she wasn't going to be a, able to to come and, and play. So it was just kind of last minute, Byron, you're going to be, you're going to be the starter. Uh, player up. Yeah, which was like, it came as a total surprise to me. Um, and uh, yeah, it was just crazy to, to get to play a ton of minutes and and help help our team win. It was yeah. It was it's hard to describe uh, the feeling uh, playing in that final game against the U.S. I, I had a bunch of family in the in the audience uh, from Ontario that had never seen me play before, and uh, we to start that game we went down by like five points like really quickly. Um, and I was on the court while that was happening. Yeah, it was, it was just kind of a, a reversal from that big London game that um, for anybody who's been watching all of our episodes that Trevor discussed in uh, the previous one. Yeah, like it was like it was just a total like stomach dropping moment where like this game is slipping out of control so fast and all the momentum was on the US and they were fired up and like we were just kind of deflated. Um, and, uh, you know, and I was playing on the 3-5-2-2.5 when that was happening. And then 
we came out with the high low and I was still on that. And we started to kind of stabilize. And it was, uh, I think it was right at the start of the third quarter, uh, we threw on our three, five, two, one, five, one. And suddenly like we had like three or four quick turnovers and it brought us right back in the game. And the crowd was going crazy. And there was some USA chants earlier in the game and, and the crowd started chanting Canada, go Canada, go to kind of overpower the US fans. And it was just, yeah, it was just such a yeah. wild experience. It's the kind of experience you, you dream of as a kid, right? Yeah. Like when you're watching hockey or the Stanley Cup or, or wh whatever sport that you're really into. And it's just those moments you dream of, right? When you're out in the driveway and you're like, oh, like gonna score the last goal or, or hearing the crowd go crazy. And, and just to be on the court and part of that team and part in that environment, it's just so cool. So cool. It's, it's like, it's everything you dream of when, when you're thinking of trying to make the national team and represent your country. So, nice. so super, super, yeah, it's a really cool memory that I'll cherish. Yeah. And now speaking of representing your country, it was just made official uh, yesterday that you will once again be representing um, Canada at a Paralympic Games. Uh, you'll be going to Tokyo with the team. Um, so talk to me a little bit about what that means to you and what you're most excited about in your second games. Yeah, it's a, it, you know, it's a huge honor to represent Canada and to be selected uh, as one of one of the 12 athletes that get to play wheelchair rugby for for Canada. Um, it was a it was a big battle right this year, there was 14 athletes that were all vying for that spot for the last couple of years and, and everyone really put in a lot of hard work and, and put their best foot forward and I'm sure the coaches had a tough time narrowing it down to 12. So I'm super grateful to be one of those 12 and, uh, you know, props to, to the, all 14 of us that really pushed each other hard to, to be the best that we could be. Um, and yeah, uh, going into Tokyo, I'm just excited to play the tournament. There's five teams really that, that could win gold, a gold medal at this, games and I don't think that's ever really been the case at previous Paralympics with wheelchair rugby the depth of competition is really starting to grow uh, across the world which is awesome to see and awesome for the fans because it just makes every game more exciting when they're close um, it, I mean it's not so great for Canada because we used to be one of the teams that were always at the top but now we just have to work a little bit harder for it yeah. which is which is I guess it's fine. It's, it's, it makes you earn it a little bit more. Um, yeah. So super excited just to play in such a competitive tournament. Uh, it, it's going to be interesting with all the COVID restrictions. We're not quite sure what, what it's going to be like in the village and what the experience will be like compared to Rio or, or previous Paralympics. But at the same time, um, the team is so close and we have so much fun regardless of what's going on around us that it, it doesn't really matter to be honest what the village or what restrictions are going to be there we're going to have a we're going to find a way to to have a blast and uh, play hard and uh, and compete so yeah and i think it, it's funny how you mentioned you know working that little bit harder and and having to earn it a little bit more, even though obviously teams at any stage of history definitely have had to earn a gold medal For <laughs> Don't sure. on there, yeah. but um, it's, it's been a really interesting quad for, um, for everybody um, dealing with COVID obviously, and, and the games being postponed by a year and all of the, the challenges around training and competitions in that realm. Um, but also for Canada, it's been an interesting quad for you guys, because normally you're right there in the, the top three, four spots, and coming into this games, you know, you guys are coming in ranked fifth. Um, you've had quite a bit of change within your team. Um, a few results, you know, at Worlds and, and some previous championships not quite going your way. So what's it been like um, for you, this quad, to be a part of the team and, and deal with all of that adversity to get to where you are now? 
Yeah, totally. Um, you know, it is a bit a bit of a unique quad for for Team Canada. Uh, we we had to go to the qualify like the last qualification tournament, which we've never had to do before. I don't think. Um, so we qualified uh, in March of 2020 at the Richmond Olympic Oval. Uh, so it was tournament to determine the last two teams that got to got to go to Tokyo. Uh, and like right after that tournament was finished, COVID really flared up and, and every the whole world went into lockdown. Um, and we figured that, you know, for the first couple of months, Tokyo was still on and still gonna happen in August of 2020. So it was a pretty crazy couple of months where we're trying our hardest to train at home at the same level uh, that you do in a normal environment and, and get ready um, get ready for the Paralympics that were just going to be like four months away. So it, it was a bit of a blessing when the Paralympics got delayed for a year. I think it's it actually really, really it's going to be a benefit for us, for Team Canada, giving that extra year to train together, uh, make sure that we're in good physical condition, uh, allowed us to take a look at our or strategies and, and make some tweaks there and just fine tuning and, and really come into Tokyo prepared. Um, it's interesting because we haven't really gotten to play at any tournaments. So it, it and it, it's been pretty similar for all the teams that are going to be there. I think teams have managed to play one or two little tournaments here or there, but for the most part, we're coming, all the teams are coming in a little bit tournament rusty, uh, for lack of a better word. Um, so it's really going to be interesting to see how that affects teams and and how teams have preparing, been preparing in such a unique year, right? Um, yeah, yeah, it's going to be it's going to be a wild one. Yeah, with the the combination of, of the COVID situation, the lack of tournaments, um, and really the depth of field. I think Tokyo for, for wheelchair rugby fans or anyone who's watching, who's going to be watching the competition for the first time, it's really going to be expect the unexpected, you know, throw the seedings out and just watch the games and see what happens. Yeah. Um, and just to touch back on the, on your previous question there, Canada is definitely an underdog, right? You mentioned that we're ranked fifth coming into this tournament and uh, in previous Paralympics, we've always been ranked like maybe third, like a, a little bit higher, right? And always have been uh, considered a medal favorite. What what the color of that medal is was always kind of up in the air, but we were kind of always in, in that picture, right? Coming into this one, we are ranked fifth and are probably considered a little bit of an underdog. So it, it is a bit of a unique situation for Canada, but I think it, it favors, favors us really well. And uh, I know all the athletes we have a lot of pride in wheelchair rugby. Uh, the sport was invented in Canada and, and uh, you know, we're pr really proud of that fact. And we're really proud to represent Canada internationally. And we're looking to show that, that we are a top rugby nation. And so, so watch out. I think we're coming in and we're prepared to upset some of these higher ranked teams. Cool. Well, that wraps up all of my sport questions for today. Um, but time to get into a few fun ones, just so people can get to know Byron Green, the human, not just Byron Green, the athlete. Um, so, B, what is your go-to pregame meal? Uh, uh, to be honest, I don't really have, like, a specific meal that I have to eat pregame. Uh, yeah, night before, you know, I'll just make sure I eat a decent amount, Uh and then kind of day of, a bit of a lighter breakfast. Uh, usually like an oatmeal is always a great option if it's available, but uh, when it, I'm not too picky. And then kind of like right before the game, I, I like to go in uh, with a bit of a lighter stomach. And during the game, if I'm needing it, you know, Gatorade and fruit bars are, are always a great way to go. So yeah, so nothing, nothing too, particular if you had to compete in another paralympic sport on the program what would it be 
Ooh, that's a that's a tough yeah. You know, I've tried quite a few other Paralympic sports. Uh yeah, I think if I was gonna it would be nice to do tennis. Uh, I probably don't have the function level to be a Paralympic level for tennis, but if I did, I think that would be a lot of fun. Cool. Um, do you have any pregame routines or superstitions? Yeah, so that's an interesting one. So we'd go through quite an extensive warm up with Team Canada. So so that kind of takes care of like th that part of the pregame routine because we all kind of it's we all kind of do it together. There's little moments where you can add individualized elements to it. But I think where that pregame routine really kicks in for each athlete is when we're strapping up, getting ready, like in our in our locker room. Yeah. You know, a lot of guys will have, have headphones on and they're in a very specific mind space, getting themselves focused and whatnot. And I'll, I'll take that opportunity to do that as well, especially when another great moment is like when you're lining up to enter to really start to dial in that way and get into that zone. Um, and then you see other guys in the locker room where they're joking around and laughing and kind of, and that's part of their pregame routine. And I'm kind of a mix of both. I like to, to banter with the guys as we're getting ready a little bit, uh, but also I'll take a, a few minutes here and there to, to kind of go over my our game plan and, and what I'm going to be doing specifically on the courts just to kind of really get focused in. The joys of team sport. You got a good mix of different personalities. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, another fun question. What is your ideal off day? So say you have a day off from training, a day off from, from any of that stress. What is one of your favorite things to do? I know you're quite the family man. So. Yeah. Uh, favorite thing to do is probably go on a bike ride with the family, something pretty relaxing and just, have a day where I don't have any commitments and just kind of go with the flow for the day. But getting out on the bike is always kind of fun. Uh, hanging out with our little guy is always a blast too. So cool. Yeah, something just cash. Nice. And to wrap it up now, is there anything about you or about um, wheelchair rugby that you'd like to share with our audience before we sign off? I, if you've never watched it, I, Give it, give it a watch because it's it's a blast. It's it's one of the sports that is really spectator friendly. I find, um, and yeah, it, it it's there's a lot of depth to it as well. As soon as you start learning about the classification system and, and the different point values and then the different strategies that go on on court with different styles of lineups, um, the roles that each athlete is doing. Uh, it's really cool. So lots of depth to the sport. Nice. All right. Well, if you want to watch Byron and the rest of Team Canada uh, at the Paralympics, the wheelchair rugby competition starts um, on August 25th. Um, all the games will be available through CBC Sports. Um, both us and Wheelchair Rugby Canada will be sharing plenty of content um, around that schedule and what that's going to look like in Canadian time zones on uh, the lead up to the game. So you can cheer on Byron and the rest of Team Canada as, as they go for gold in Tokyo. Um, thank you so much for joining us, Byron. Um, congratulations on your accomplishments and thank you for all that you do for uh, Wheelchair Rugby in BC as well. I know you're involved in a coaching and a grass uh, recruitment and grassroots role and it's just really great to see. So um, thanks for giving us your time today. I um, really appreciate it. And uh, yeah, we can't wait to root for you in Tokyo. Thanks so much, Nate.